Former Home Secretary Jackie Smith joins the How To Be 60 podcast this week. Expect more personal than political. They say about divorce, don't they, that you don't only lose the past, you also lose the future, and that's what I felt. So I've had to rebuild what my 60s will be like. And I'm wondering how to be 60. It's scaring the shit out of me. Hello and welcome to another HDB 60. No, no, I'm going to do that again. Oh, no, actually, I'm not going to do it again. I'm just going to admit to everyone that I'm just totally stressed. So let's just breathe. I was okay until I came into the room. Yeah, well, yes, I know, but you. Ju- anyway, let's. Right, okay, let's. Come on, shake my hand. Oh, your hands are freezing. Oh, my God. I'll give you a gesture of goodwill. Sorry. Now, sh- here we go. Right. Welcome to another How to Be 60 podcast. A look at life beyond the big 6 0 with me, Kay Adams. And her, Karen McKenzie. Um, and gosh, you could not get a bigger contrast, a greater contrast between us today because Karen has just returned from a sex festival oh, in cute. Puglia with her bendy sister, Aggie. Yes, remember those ankles behind those ears, girls. And Ian and I are a complete couple of crocs. Sex so I, festival in Puglia. Well, come on, come on. With the Karen, ex-husband. You, 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 Not you, mine, Ag's ex-husband. You were in a threesome. <laughs> oh, Jesus, it's getting better. I think not. It was a lovely holiday. In- look at the look on your face. See, I've I got my God, posh camera now. Ridiculous. Everyone will be able to see. I, I mean, Jackie Smith, hey. our guest, who I'll introduce in a second, can see it. You can see it, can't you, Jackie? Just nod. She can, yeah, no, she is. She can see it. What is it with you? You're, you're kind of you're like blushing. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm absolutely you're just not blushing. Because it is no, quite warm in here. Probably. It is not warm in here. I've got three jumpers and I think I'm going to be wearing one each week for listen, the entire summer. Listen, and I'm layered up. And of course, you have to come up that bloody bray before you get to your house. And then I have to listen, pull off my clothes, shut push up. my bike up. The cat is out of the bag with you, lady. It really what? is. Reading material, check. We know that it is racy. Bendy sister, check. We know why Aggie's doing her yoga. Um, rural retreat in Italy at the end of March. Very odd time to go to a rural retreat in Italy at the end of March. That's when they have special festivals. Now, sometimes it's to see the camellias come out because that's very popular in rural Italy, but not for you. You were clearly at one of the sex festivals that you are so fond of. I love how you're and inventing this wonderful <laughs> scenario because your own life is clearly so dull that you've got to kind of like put it into mine. Well, I'm flattered, Kay, but well, disappointed it did not happen. Oh, no, you are correct. My life is so dull. Ian and I yes. are a pair of crocs. My leg is still terrible. I can't walk the length of myself. It's murderous. He oh, had the his knee. Yeah, Jeez. the knee. The knee. I am going to have to have an elastic bandage, I think. Whoa. I know. That's I know. unattractive. Very unattractive. He had his 61st birthday, so we went away for the weekend. No, we went away for the night. Oh, Big. very romantic. Was, well, it, was it romantic? Well, Did you take the book? It could have been. No, we the didn't. book. Well, you know, one of those big posh beds that's really high, Aye. you know, that looks as if it's... You could fit another five foot in between you. Couldn't get up on it. Oh I, I couldn't get up on sakes. it. Um, his back is murderous. Oh, I mean, God I, his back's almighty. gone. And so if anyone heard us through the, the wall, they probably thought it was you and Aggie. I that was <laughs> She's my sister. <laughs> well, uh, but his husband. Brother-in-law. <laughs> Listen, we're of an age that we don't really care anymore. But it occurred to me when we were away, you know, this beautiful hotel, the noises of age. We get, you know, it's just like. What? Well, no, I don't. No, you're kind of got, get, no, 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 no. But that's no. it. It's not sex. Oh, 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 I see. It's like you're the getting creaking. out of a chair. Oh, and then he's gone very nasally. Oh, that's annoying. You know, and you're in bed, and you know, spooning, very nice, yeah. very romantic. You know, and he's snuggled up at the back of your ear, and then he goes. You can, oh. you can do it with a dog, but not with um, oh. a, another human. Honestly. No, it's not Honestly. no, it's not good. It's not attractive. It's anyway, not sexy either. We are all right talking about this because we've got Jackie Smith with us, who is, of course, a former Home Secretary, the first female to hold that office in the UK. But thankfully, she is also fond of smut, <laughs> as evidenced by her um, podcast, For the Many, with Ian Dale, who we yes. spoke to um, a few yeah. weeks ago. So it's a political podcast with added smut. Uh, and also, 
Correct. And Jackie shared the dubious honour with me of being voted first out of Strictly. Oh my God, is that right? Uh, oh, well, there shouldn't be us that you can talk to about <laughs> that. Dear. Thank uh-huh. God I didn't get this injury when I was doing Strictly. You know what, Kate? I did think about that. What would you have done? Well, I don't know. I'd have to have done the tango with Nordic walking but, pose. But would you have been able to dance? Probably not. No, I wouldn't. Shit. Actually, that would have been a good get I out. know, actually. That's your right. That, Grab the I? money and off. I know. Do you know what it is? Apparently, this is quite funny, this. My glutes aren't firing. What the hell does that mean? Well, you remember we talked about my flat arse? And it is flat. It is flat. It's like yeah, a drop sure scone. Right. <laughs> I'm not a big, airy, fluffy one. I'm talking a pancake. It's a total. Is that, do you know what you want to do? You want to do curtsy lunges with a weight. Well, no, I say I can't do anything just now. I can barely walk. So mm-hmm. I'm in rehab, right? And I've got to clench. I've got to clench my buttocks uh-huh. to try and fire my glutes. But... It's really difficult to do while you're walking. I mean, your pelvic floor is relatively easy. You can just do funny walks coming up. You can pull that up all the time. You can stand at a bus stop. It doesn't really matter. No one notice. But with your glutes, I'll just show you. It's more of a thrusting motion. Oh, you know, oh, oh it's just just stop it. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your time is some. Um, so you could get arrested. So oh, Jesus, it's, yeah. it's quite difficult. Mm-hmm. It is actually. I'm trying to even do my Try pelvic it. floor Try at the it. moment, and that's hard do enough. You do your glutes. Fire your glutes. I don't know how to fire my glutes. Clench Listen. Your buttocks. I'm too You don't have to do day. that with your face. I do, though. That's the thing I do. <laughs> Nothing works without the facial. Do you bother with uh, your pelvic floor anymore? Or do you just let it all go? Do you know what I still do? You know how when you have kids, they always say, yeah, do yeah. And you think, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's years ahead of me to do that. What I do is. When I go for a pee, try and stop it in mid-flow. Yeah. yeah. I have to say, I've not done it for a Did they teach months. you that at the sex festivals? Uh, did I teach them? They teach me or did I teach them? Can't remember which way about it was. Let's try it. Try it. Did you watch Happy Valley? Yeah. I, you know when Sarah Lancashire was just like battering lumps out of people? All the time, yeah. I'm looking at her thinking, I wonder if your pelvic floor is up to that. Or maybe there's just something that's letting go there. That's what you were thinking. That is what I was thinking. Isn't that bizarre? You think so? No, I'm just enjoying it. She was good. She was. She was amazing. But I'm just worried about her. Uh, She's 56. Young thing. Yep. Yep. Do you want some emails? Yep. 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 Um, This is, listen, there's an email coming up. You're going to love. I'm even going to let you read it out. Um, It's from Jill. She says, I'm going to be 60 in June. And like Kay, I was in total denial. I do not feel 60. Not that I know what 60 should feel like. Well, that's true, isn't it? Uh, But it doesn't feel like 10 years since I was 50. How should I act? I'm acting the same as always, but is that inappropriate? Do I embarrass myself? Do I embarrass my children? Do I care? Slightly. What happens next? I've loved listening to these podcasts to hear all these views, especially those that are, uh, let's go for all the things that I didn't think I could do. But for now, uh, I no longer care so much what people think and why not. God, all these questions. And it's true, isn't it? You've been through them all. Did it ever occur to you, how should I be at 60? No. 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 No, I, I was looking forward to it. Yeah, but you didn't think that you should be another way. Uh, no. No, because you morph into it. Or you just it happens and there's no big difference. That you don't Well, you did actually grow a couple of horns the next day. I remember that. No, but no, nothing different happens. So no, no. Yeah. I didn't think about how I should be. Did you? Uh well got a bloody podcast about it. Oh yeah. God, I'm sweating. I cannot believe that Stop you're Stop your sweating. fucking moaning. Honestly. Me. This has nothing to do with the temperature in here and your hands are freezing. Look at my blooming energy bill that's going around. Like okay, I'm going to let you read this out. You're going to love it. This just shows you what a generous and decent person this I am. This one from Claire H. Do you want me to hold it back a bit? Are your eyes? Oh, so I've got my glasses sure? on. I can hold it back here if you like. Shut up. Right, um, I have really enjoyed all your podcasts. We've got to read this bit. Oh, sorry, I missed that. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Well, Kay's not mentioned at all. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Yeah, I really enjoyed all your podcasts. With the other presenter, what's her name? <laughs> much prefer it. You oh, have much it, prefer you have it, it prepared, when you have, have guests. You. you don't deserve that email. Would you be quiet? Much prefer You're so controlling. Much prefer it when you have guests on that are not selling something, i.e. a book or tour. I always listen to you when out walking my lovely dog. I mean, your cat, your hobbies. Stop it. Three hobbies, puzzles, walking, etc. Oh, apart from the camper van. Love life after work. Thank you. And that's from Clear with an I. And she said, Oh, I. P.S. Um, if you like, you can tell Kay she's doing a great job too. Um, 
you know, we get lots of emails who we love the podcast, which is great. I mean, it's fantastic. And keep your emails coming in. Yep. Yeah. What's the address again? HTB60.com. No, that's no, not no, right. No, it's, not. it's podcast. Oh, podcast. At HTB60.com. <laughs> podcast at HTB60.com. Mm-hmm. Not getcom. Dot com. Um, and it's really nice, but I knew they wouldn't last. And I was looking at the reviews on the podcast and there is a stinker. Uh, and don't worry, it's about me. It says, my goodness, Kay has never met a person half as interesting as Kay Adams. Only a mother would enjoy pap like this. It's horrible. <laughs> it made me laugh, actually, because I do sometimes bore the arse off myself. Well, that's true. You bore it off me as well. But do you not bore the arse off yourself sometimes? Uh, yeah. When I'm whittering like this, I'm actually bored of my own voice already. So it's not great. But, no. um yeah, I start a story and I think this is going absolutely fucking nowhere. I've run out of time. Just cut to the chase. Edit, 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 and I don't manage it. Mm. So, yeah, I think that's... I'm, I'm, yeah. And then I say to my kids, have I told you about the time? Oh, God. And they go, only, yeah, only yeah, you times have, Mum. And you say, oh, my God, I'm... I, I know. I mean, I think you come to a point, I've actually, you've... You've got a sell by date. Run out of steam. That's well, it, isn't it? Thank God Jackie Smith's coming up because she might enliven the conversation with her after this. Gotta get better. Hello, Jackie. How are you? Save us from ourselves, our boring selves. I hope you're feeling very exciting and engaging today. I'm feeling very excited about being with you two. And you have um prompted all sorts of feelings in my glutes and in <laughs> other parts of me. Are I've you been, firing? <laughs> I've been at yoga this morning. That's a six-year-old mm. thing to do, isn't it? Yes. Well, sorry, but why yoga. are you going to yoga is the question. I love yoga. I've been going for three or four years now. Um, but I'm particularly going to yoga at the moment because I also quite like running. But I, whilst we're on the subject of our injuries, I've, I've got a dodgy ankle now mm. because a fortnight ago when I was in Leeds doing one of the live shows with, with Ian Dale – I um, fell off a pavement. I, I twisted my ankle off a pavement. And you know, when you get to our age, you know when you were younger, you fall over. When you're our age, you have a fall. Oh, so that's you, true. Uh, yeah. So I had a fall uh, on the street in Leeds, having twisted my ankle, mm. uh, which I actually got x-rayed yesterday. And um, it's okay. It's not broken. Uh, so I've therefore just got to basically crack on and make it healthy again. How are you feeling about the ageing process? I'm I'm feeling fine, actually. I feel I felt much better. I was 60 last November. I had a party. It was great. Um, I feel much better about being 60 than I felt about being 50. That felt like a bit of a moment. But I feel um, like... Uh, health, reasonably healthy, still got enough work to keep me going and interested. Uh, and but you know, going back to something else that you were, you were saying, you do get to the point, don't you, where you just sort of think, oh, make the most of it. Let's not <laughs> be bothered what other people think. Let's just crack on and do the things. You know, I I quite often say to people, well, if I'm not not in a sort of depressed way, but if I'm not doing it now, I'm not going to do it probably. And so I've spent a lot of my life sort of planning and thinking about the future and doing things for the next step, whether in terms of my career or my family or whatever. Now I feel I can live in the moment more and I can do the things that I want to do. And that's really liberating. Uh Is that a sense of urgency because of age or is it also because you've been released from that political world. I mean, I know it's been, you know, more than a decade now, but it's a very different life that you're leading now than the one that you were leading probably when you were approaching 50. Yeah. It's a bit of both, actually, Kay, I think. I, you're right that I am liberated to be much freer about what I say, what I do, because not once I left Parliament, I say left, was booted out of Parliament by the electorate. Um, the first decision you then have to make is, do you want to go back again? And I decided straight away I didn't want to stand for election again. Once you've done that, of course, you don't have to be careful about what you say all of the time. So all of those opinions that I've always had, I can now express freely. Um, so that's that's one part of it. But there is also something about thinking uh 
you might as well just get on with it because otherwise you're not necessarily going to have the opportunity. It's not a sort of, it's, it's, I suppose in some ways it is, there's a limited amount of, of time, but it, it makes me feel more positive rather than making me feel depressed about what I have left to do. I'm interested you say you're a bit out of parliament because, to be honest, I wasn't sure how you were going to be about that, you know, <laughs> and I was just going to feel my uh-huh. way around it. But you're obviously pretty upfront about it. Um, you know, you did leave parliament in not the best of circumstances because you were caught up in the expensive uh, scandal and famously or infamously, you know, there was on your expenses two pornographic movies that your, your husband had uh, downloaded. <laughs> Did that feel like the end of the world? Um, yes. I suppose that's another liberating thing because, you know, I was on the front of every newspaper, as you say. You know, I was asso- associated with both expenses and pornography. As my sister, who's a journalist, said to me, it's hard to imagine a worse combination of things than first female home secretary pornography um, claims. So. Um, it was dreadful. It was absolutely horrible being at the centre of that storm. It was horrible personally. It was horrible for my family. It was horrible politically. I mean, I would have lost my seat anyway because it was a marginal seat. But um, of course, I was high profile. So at the point at which I lost, uh, you know, my my boys still think it's vaguely amusing that uh, the BBC website had a picture of me at the 2010 election with the headline, Biggest Loser, uh, over it. Um, So all of that was horrible. Mm. But that's also strangely, once you get through it, and it takes some time, but once you get through it, it's also reasonably liberating because, you know, I, I never want to go back there, but then it's not likely that I ever would. So you sort of feel, even when bad things happen in your career or whatever, well, at least it's not going to be as bad as that. And of course, I left Parliament, booted out of Parliament, uh, as you say, when I was um, 48. Uh, Yeah, 48. So um, the good thing about that is that I've then had long enough to, to build up and to do other things. So I've now had 12, 13 years of building almost my sort of third part of my career because I was a teacher for 11 years before I went into Parliament. Then I was a Member of Parliament and a Minister for 13 years. And now I've had another 12, 13 years of really doing lots of interesting things. Mm. So although I never wanted that to happen, I've been fortunate that I can find other things to do to, to that are exciting and fulfilling. And I mean, we want to talk about that, but just a little bit. I mean, you said booted out twice. Did you take a decision that I'm going to own this? Um, I don't think I ever sat down and thought about it because it was a bit too painful to think about it in that way. But and in one way, I am. I mean, don't forget the way I I, I did say just then I would have lost anyway. So which is actually which is actually. Honestly, that is true. But obviously, I wouldn't have lost with the profile that I that I lost with. But also, you know, without getting too sort of sanctimonious about it, I also strongly believe that if you want to have a democracy, you've got to have people that lose their seats. Why did you want to go into it? To go into politics in the first yeah. place. I've wanted to do it for as long as I can remember. You know, I... I one way that I cope with what I went through is that I know that I did the thing that I dreamt about doing Mm. almost from the time I was, you know, able to even think about anything. So my parents were both um, political. They were local councillors. It was a Labour Party family. I loved politics. I loved the sound of my own voice. I loved um, what I thought was speaking up for other people. I loved arguing. I thought politics was the place that was exciting and where you could get things done. So that was why I wanted to do it. You know, I did. I went through that slightly traditional uh, route in some ways. You know, I was quite active in student politics when I was at university. I spent a year working in parliament afterwards. I then went off and taught, taught for um, 11 years, as I say. Uh, so, you know, I like to think that of that as a proper job. 
Uh, during that time, however, I was also a councillor and, and um, in Redditch where I was living, and then I was elected to Parliament, and then I became a minister. It was so exciting and interesting and an enormous honour. And I still think that, even though, even despite everything that I went through. How was it as a personal experience? So you, you realised this this great ambition and you were the first female um, Home Secretary. Was it two, wasn't it was 2007? Yeah, 2007. 2007, You yeah. were given the job, um, you know, by Gordon Brown, weren't yeah. you? Um, from a personal point of view, you were kind of cast as... A, well, I don't. What were your friends? A friend described you as tough as old boots, and you kind of had that public persona, didn't you? Um, which is very different from the one that we see now. So, like, well, the real Jackie Smith t- uh, stand up, as they always say. But, but how did you feel about having that kind of reputation imposed on you? I suppose. Um, I don't mind being called tough. Uh, I don't think you get to be a minister for 10 years unless you're reasonably tough. I don't think you get to survive what I've been through without being reasonably resilient. I think sometimes women sort of back off the idea that they want to be called tough. I'm perfectly happy to be called tough because I think also it's possible to mix that with, I mean, and I think part of that tough came from being Home Secretary. And there's something about being, I mean, you know, let's look at all of the Home Secretaries that have come subsequently. Mm. And I'm pleased to say that although I was the first woman, of course, I've been quite a few since. Um, by definition, of course, what you're doing as Home Secretary tends to be about imposing order, whether or not at the border or in terms of policing or in counter terror or whatever. So there'll be an element of that that will always look quite um, quite tough. But um, I also have, I hope, I believe I have a sense of humour. I think I have a sense of fun. I think, um, I, don't, I hope I don't take myself too seriously. I mean, that was probably one of the things that I found quite difficult as Home Secretary. You know, I used to, I had to put away my brightly coloured jackets and I had to not smile in public and um uh although I still had a reputation in the cabinet for trying to lighten the mood. So I would sometimes say it, tell a joke or make a crack around the around the cabinet table, even when I was home secretary, because for God's sake, you know, take the job seriously. Don't take yourself too seriously and you know, I don't believe there's any job in the world where you can't have a laugh. Or if there is, it isn't a job I would want to do anyway. But that's interesting, isn't it? That you kind of felt the need instinctively or otherwise, to, you know, to wear more kind of sober clothing uh, and just sort of arrange your features in a sort of serious and grave way. Uh, um, were you given that advice or did you just say, no, no, this is the way i got to play it? I just don't forget, within 24 hours of me becoming the Home Secretary, there was the foiled terror attack in London and then the terrorists drove up to Scotland and drove their jeep into the front of in front of Glasgow Airport. That was less than 24 hours after I became the Home Secretary. And um, I didn't know I was going to be the Home Secretary. And of course, if you're Home Secretary, you've got protection and you're quite limited in the things that you can do. And I had to stay in London that weekend when I didn't think I would have to. I thought I was going to go home. So, um, you know, obviously, on the one hand, I'm dealing with terrorist attack, getting my head around the the job, reading into the into everything. On the other hand, I'm thinking, shit, I haven't got that lipstick that I uh, need and I've got to replace my foundation. And I can remember saying to the staff, is it? Would it be okay if I just like, if we've got a gap, could I just go up the road to John Lewis and just like get some makeup? And they looked at me. <laughs> no, the Home Secretary can't be seen to be going and buying. <laughs> to be normal. Lipstick. <laughs> buying them <laughs> lipstick in the course of the terrorist attack. I mean, I'm not sure any of the previous Home Secretaries had worn lipstick. I mean, who knows? Perhaps they did. But <laughs> um, but so uh, it sort of, nobody told me. But I realised in thinking about what the job was that this was a serious job, and you don't, and you can't be, and you you don't have time, and you can't be caught looking as if you are taking it trivially, which I I didn't. I took it really seriously. 
I mean, Jesus. this is. Uh, I mean, this is not meant to be a cheeky question at all. Oh, but God. you know, Holmes. No, 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 stop. But I mean, Home Secretary, as you say, very, very important job, very serious job. You had two terrorist attacks within forty-eight hours. Were you sure you knew how to do it? <laughs> well, that's not a cheeky job because I, I had. That's not a cheeky question. Sorry, um, Kay, because. Funnily enough, it links to how I first met Ian Dale, who's now my podcast partner. So the answer is, yes, I definitely knew how to do it. I had been a minister for eight years. I had been in the cabinet as chief whip. I knew what was going on across government. I'd been in a whole four other different departments and jobs. So, And I was good at it. So yes, I could definitely do the job. But the thing, and I made the mistake of saying this in an interview with Ian, the thing about being a minister is you know, it's not like any other job. You don't get to choose. You get told where you're going. You don't get an induction. You don't get any time to get into the job. You know, witness the fact that I woke up the first morning as Home Secretary, or I was woken up the first morning as Home Secretary to be told that there was a terrorist attack. Um, and I'm not sure that's a good way of running a government, really. And I said this in an in interview that I did with Ian qu pretty quickly after I um, uh, resigned as Home Secretary. And um, it wasn't his fault, but this got reported as, you know, oh, Jackie Smith says she was clueless as uh, Home I Secretary. I saw that, which yeah. Sort of, which sort of, I mean, it's just crap, isn't it? But um, somebody says training is a good idea and then they get called clueless. I'm not, you know, I think anybody does a job better if they've been trained to do it. And um, so I don't didn't mind that I said it. I just thought it was naff the way it was uh, the way it was reported. Yeah, and I mean certainly in terms of you know the recent Conservative government, I mean it's been revolving doors in terms of you know ministers going in and out of different departments. And you know realistically, it doesn't matter how smart somebody is, it takes you a while to get your head mm. around a, a brief. You know if it's education or transport or Home Secretary or whatever. Um, you know, and, and I often marvel at it and think, God, how'd you just pick up, you know, pick up the folder for that one? Oh my God! I know. Does does anything make you nervous now? Given what we were talking about previously, uh, doing my live show with Ian makes me nervous. Doing um, doing big sort of events and things still makes me nervous. And so it bloody it should do, shouldn't it? Because you know, if you're not nervous, you're not trying. I don't think. I mean, I I I think I have a sense of proportion. So I feel I don't. If something goes wrong, I think to myself. Well, I've been through everything that I've been through, to be honest. I'm going to get through this. So I now do believe that everything, you know, that you can get through, uh, that you can get through everything. So to that extent, I'm much calmer professionally than I used to be. And I've also, of course, been through difficult personal times as well. So um, you just, you know, it cliche, cliche, but it, what doesn't destroy you makes you stronger, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. That's what my mum always said. What yeah. doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, or character building was her yeah, other uh, great phrase. True, yeah. But I mean, yeah. But I mean, like, well, my eldest daughter's 20, and, you know, I don't mean everything is the end of the world. It's not that she's overly dramatic, but obviously everything means a lot to her. Every exam yeah. means a lot to her. You know, every essay means a lot to her. And <laughs> I guess as you get older, you realize, well, I've been through it. I'm still here, you know, like me reading out that email, you know, Kay yeah. obviously loves herself. There's nobody as fascinating as Kay. Well, it's not nice, but you think, well, hey, yeah. <laughs> hey I've had worse. I probably will have worse. And, and I know, I it. wondered who you're reading out for because they're not going to be listening. Yeah, well, I, well they I, do I, listen though, presumably. Don't well, yeah. I'm Isn't constantly it? amazed at the critics who <sighs> are giving it all this and having a go at you. And they and still yet, listen. still they're still yeah, listening. They're still following you on Twitter. They're still watching you on the telly. I mean, get over yourselves, guys. But there, there is something, though, I, I think, I don't know, you might not agree, either of you, but that you have to be able to take criticism or... I mean, that that is, you know, everyone's willing, everyone's uh, entitled to their opinion, but you have to be quite hard on yourself, I think. You have to look at yourself and think, did I cock up? You know, yeah. was I wrong? Because otherwise, if you get to this stage and you're not prepared to, to look at yeah. yourself and be honest, then, you know, it's... Well, there's that. But then there is, you know, you're in the public eye. Do you not just, can you actually put a shield up there saying, you know what, you get, we, there's, there's, 
all sorts out there, don't they? And and they might be personal. I mean, probably is personal. I have no idea. But yeah, you can look at things. But it, on the other hand, I just think, ignore it. No, but I think you're right, Kay, because I think the real danger I felt about being in the political spotlight and in the sort of hoo-ha of, of the news was I became very, I to protect myself, I had to really build a very thick skin. Mm not look at what people were saying about me, that type of thing. In the end, that's dehumanising, isn't it? And I think the problem is if you don't, if you're not reflective, I mean, don't let things destroy you. But if, if you think to yourself, well, oh, yeah, all right, well, that person's rude and horrible, but actually there is a little bit of truth in the fact that, you know, I do this or I don't do that. You've got to just reflect on that. Mm. You've got to allow yourself to change without letting it, undermine who you really are. You know, that's fair enough. I, I, I personally do feel that. Otherwise, I do think that you can get to our age, as we call it, and because we repel all criticism, and, you know, we could probably all think of examples of people who are like this, you become very um, certain of your own rightness, correctness. And, and so you become potentially quite arrogant. You know, I know the way things are. This is it. This is my opinion. Nobody's going to tell me any different and I'm not shifting. And I don't want to get older like that. Exactly. You've got to find that balance, haven't you, uh. between not shutting yourself off from things, but not letting it destroy you. And that does mean you've got to be a bit tough. But the other thing that I find is I don't want to get out of touch either. I mean, I don't think everything about the world now is, you know, uh, I, I'm not I'm not obsessed with the fact that the young are always right, but the young are right about some things. And I feel very grateful to have two sons who I'm perfectly happy to say to them on all sorts of different issues, tell me, wh wh why do people think this? So difficult issues like trans rights, for example. Um or, you know, things to do with the environment where I just don't feel that I've got the zeitgeist at all. And I need to be able to say to them, why do people think this? What's the what's the issue here? Why are people believing the other? And I find them really helpful to sort of keep me refreshed, I suppose, because when I was younger, I did think I knew it all. And I felt I was, you know, uh, old people. Oh, why don't you ever listen to what I've got to say? Well, I don't feel that quite like that anymore, but I do feel that I've got a duty to keep listening to people who've got a different view to me, particularly because perhaps they're younger and they're seeing things in a different way. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. But I don't uh -huh. think there's a perfect, there's a balance to be struck, but I doubt uh -huh. you're ever going to get it dead on the nose. You're going to go one way or another, I think, at some point. Uh -huh. I mean, you did say that you've also been through some difficult personal times. I mean, w when you left Parliament, you and your husband, you, st you stayed together uh -huh. despite... Uh -huh. Um, the circumstances of, of that, yeah. but then you split up. What a few years ago? Yeah, split up about uh, tw t end of twenty eighteen. I heard you using this horrible expression, "grey divorce." Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's what I'm. I'm still not quite divorced. I'm on the verge of being divorced. I mean, it's taken us quite a long time, partly because we didn't want to involve lawyers in it because we still get on. Uh, we get on all right, really. Um, but that, that was really tough because I'd been married over 30 years and um, I thought that we would grow old together. And in fact, one of the things I was looking forward to about being 60 and onwards was that time when you can sort of, it feels almost like you've reaped the rewards, haven't you? You've gone through the difficult years of bringing up children, your careers, all the pressures that we we'd been through, but we'd stuck together. So I felt completely robbed by the fact that he then turned round and said to me, um, "Well, he was unfaithful." And then he turned round and said, um, "I feel I need something new for the next thirty years of my life." And that wasn't how I had seen my life panning out at all. So that was a massive change, you know, change for me because as they, you know what they, they say about divorce, don't they, that you don't only lose the past, you also lose the future. And that's what I felt. So I've had to rebuild what my 60s will be like uh, in terms of relationships, in terms of what I'm going to be doing, who I'm going to be doing it with. That's been hard. Um, 
But I suppose, you know, when I'm in a positive mood, I think, oh, well, that's been a new adventure as well, but mm. difficult. So was it a total surprise? Out of the blue, you had no idea about the affair? Um, funnily enough, when he sat me down and said, I've been having an affair, the first thing I, that came out of my mouth was, I knew it. And I didn't think I did know it, but I sort of suppose, you know, in your gut, you know if something isn't quite right. And I suppose I was feeling that that something wasn't quite right. And um, so looking back on it, I can see that there were all sorts of signs that we were growing apart. And, and part of that, interestingly, was because I was slightly putting life on hold. So I was sort of thinking to myself, well, I'm, I was work. I was doing a lot of work, but I was thinking. But in a few years' time, we'll be able to come back together and spend time together. And he was obviously feeling, I'm not getting enough attention. This isn't the life that I want to live. And we weren't talking about it. Mm. And we wanted to do different things. And that's, I think, at the heart of of what went wrong. What was worse, getting booted out of Parliament or losing a 33 year old marriage? Um. The marriage was worse. Really? I thought you yeah. didn't see Parliament. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Did you? Yeah, I did, actually. Uh, I suppose I think because well, I've heard you Because you really say, think I'm very career woman. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's when you said you grew up, I mean, 30, that's a long time to be Let's with somebody. You know that you're growing apart. Part of you doesn't want to deal with it in the hope that, mm, I don't know, you mm, I don't know. I, I would have gone with the Yeah, personal. but I suppose it's because, yeah, I, I always thought that my political career would be, uh, you know, my seat was quite marginal. I sort of always knew that it would come to an end, whereas I thought my marriage was going to last forever. You know, I thought we were going to be next to each other's deathbeds. That's what that's what my picture of our life was. And yet you didn't talk about it? No, I just took it for, yeah, I just took it mm. for granted. Because mm. I thought that's what happened. You got married to somebody and then you were with the, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sort of trad wife, but my view of marriage was that's, you know, it's lovely. We depend on each other. We're going to be there around forever. And then it wasn't, it, it wasn't like that after all. So we've done the financial mediation. The money is all sorted out. We are literally at the l decree absolute stage um, now. Uh, so that's great. You know, there will, and I, yeah, it, it is. I mean, I will be, you know, I've mo I've moved on. Yeah. I've got a new partner. It's great. Everything's nice, blah, blah, blah. But it'll still be a big moment mm -hmm. when yeah. I'm not married anymore. I yeah. suppose the difference between losing a career and losing a, a long, long relationship is that is personal. Whereas, you know, losing a career, albeit in the circumstances you did, you were doing a job, you know, you might even look in back and say, well, I made mistakes, but... It was in the professional realm, whereas this is couldn't be any more intimate, could it? I mean, it's somebody you yeah. have, as you say, spent all your life with, expected to spend the rest of your life with, had two children with, etc. You cannot get away from this. Mm. This is personal. Exactly. And also, of course, I felt completely out of control, right? So mm -hmm. um, I've always felt in control of my professional life, apart from when the electric took control. Uh, but I've, uh, this was not something you could, and I've also always thought that if you work hard, things come right. So one of the other reasons why it's taken me quite a long time to get divorced is because I really tried not, to, I've tried to make the marriage work. You know, I didn't sort of go, right, that's it, you've had an affair, I'm off. Um, you know, I tr I worked over several years to try to, keep us together, which was possibly was a mistake. But anyway, that's what I, I thought, try hard enough and it'll work out. And then it didn't. And that's a real sense of not being able to control or organise something, which I which plays into everything that I dislike. So that was harder as well. Did you try marriage counselling, therapy? Yeah. Yeah, and that's yeah. Even if it makes it an easier break, it actually can help that way, I guess. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not on this occasion. <laughs>
Were, were you, did you do Strictly yeah. then when, when your relationship was going through this difficult time? I did Strictly uh, just at the point when I had realised that it was not going to work. Um, so this was a sort of, um, let's, this was a, right, getting, getting rid of him. I mean, you know, end of marriage, coming up towards 60. Uh, they asked me, I thought, oh, mm. that's an exciting adventure. Um, let's give that a go. Um, and I'm just... I don't know what you think, Kay, but notwithstanding being booted out in, <laughs> at the first opportunity, I loved it. I thought it was just so different to anything that I'd ever done uh, before. Um, and, it, you know, if anything's going to take your mind off your life, that is. Was it what you needed at that time? I think it probably was, actually. Yeah, yeah. I think it probably was. Mm. Yeah, because you must have been pretty low, I would imagine, and just to be yeah. in that sort of fairy tale world, albeit yeah. it brings its own stresses and strains. I mean, you talk it about does. you still get nervous. How did you feel when you had to go out for that first dance? I couldn't even think about it because you know, if I allowed the thought to come into my head that I was on Saturday night telly mm. in the middle of the pandemic, so people, you know, I did it in the COVID year, which had its downsides because it meant we couldn't really have an audience or anything like that, but had its upsides because people were just so grateful that it was happening um, on the telly. And I can, you know, just standing there thinking to myself, and the music's in the start and I've got to dance mm -hmm. and it's on the telly and everybody can see me. And I mean, you, you, the thing is, I felt slightly, I didn't think I was going to fall over. Well, I thought, I had so much faith in Anton that I thought, frankly, even if I fall over, he's going to pick me up and make it look like it was meant to be. <laughs> you know, they are so like that, aren't they? Um, but it is completely nerve-wracking and out of your control. Oh, my God. It, it really it really is. I can't even begin to imagine. And can I just ask, so how, how did you feel when you were the first out? She never lets me forget it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, you know, no offence, Kay, but there were fewer people. I reckon it was the equivalent, right, of being in about the third or fourth week. Because it was co because it was COVID year, there were fewer competitors. So I reckon if there'd been more competitors, they would all have been worse than me. They would have gone out earlier and I wouldn't have been the first person out. <laughs> that's my just – that's and how that's I – And that's how you're mind, in politics. Yeah, never that been logic is out complete – God. <laughs> you got to find an upside. You've just got to find an upside. Yeah. So, um, listen, our, our time is probably getting short. We've got to do our big six or bingo. Oh, but yes. how was it getting back into the dating scene then? <laughs> hmm? It was fun. It was crazy. It was, um, you know, if you want anybody to help you with, I mean, I hope you don't, but if anybody wants help with a dating profile, I'm your woman. Um, <laughs> I used apps. And um, oh, we could do a whole podcast. <laughs> it's um, it's very very different to the first time round. Well, in one way, it's very different to the first time round. In other ways, it's a bit similar. Like you know, ooh, when am I going to kiss them and all of that sort of stuff. Oh, I know, <laughs> I know. Well, let's. I've forgotten about that bit. So I was thinking more <laughs> about how many up. how many frogs did you have to go through? And there's quite a few out there as well. Well, how did you think? What, what, were, what was going through your mind or your body when you think, oh, my God, this is it. I'm now going to sleep with somebody com maybe completely different than you have done for the last 10 many years. How was that? Um, It was fine. <laughs> no, it was, sorry, fine. it was more than fine. <laughs> God, I hope so. But you are right. I mean, if you've slept with the same person for 30-something years, 32, 33 years, you you are stricken with this supposing you know supposing I've been doing it wrong all these mm -hmm. years or supposing there's something else that I should be doing. I mean, too much information. But no, I have to say, my husband. Look, okay, all right. Um, one of the nice things that my husband did was he said to me, "You're very good at sex. Don't worry about." It. <laughs> That's lovely. It's Which is a kind hear thing. That. Isn't that a kind thing to do? So I sort of thought to myself, "Oh well, I'm." I mean, how the how the hell he knew? Um, well, he didn't know because he'd been off with somebody else. But anyway, um, 
it's uh, it is that's that that and strictly equal nerve wracking, but not quite so many people watching the first one. Oh my god, right. <laughs> not quite so many. All right, well, that's, just that's a slight, a small little audience. <laughs> yes. Well, Karen's got a book that we're going to send you a copy of, <laughs> Jackie, and that'll maybe give you um, some <laughs> extra thinking. ideas. Not that it sounds like you need it to be honest. You sexy underwear, and did you feel sexy? Uh, yeah. Nice. I need That's the book though. Right. Right. Send me the book. Send me the book. I need the, the right. tips. Okay, what's the book called? We, we'll send you the book. Oh, Don't hold your head. I've got Do- a copy over here. Hang on, just a second. You've got a copy. That's what I gave you for your sixtieth. Oh, I thought you meant I've got a copy. I can send you this. Don't, Don't hold, hold my, my head. <laughs> I, I think you get the picture. Yeah, I'll yeah, send yeah. it to you. I've read it. It's very, very interesting. We're going to get um, yeah. a mission off that. Right, quick game of Big Six or Bingo. Okay. Pick yeah. two numbers uh-huh. between 1 and 50, please. 23, 41. Okay. Op- uh, right. Optimist or pessimist, Jackie? Optimist. Yeah, most definitely. Most uh, definitely. Yeah, I think we'll... What was your other one? 41, was it? I don't know. <laughs> 41. 41. <laughs> I thought it was 41. Three postmenopausal women. <laughs> I'm going for this one. Um, if you could have a million pounds and another 10 years of life or another 20 years and no cash, what would you go for? 20 years. 20 years and no cash? Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Because I can earn it. That's what I feel like. I can't earn a million pounds, but no, no, no. I was discussing this just the other day with my partner. I want to live to be 100. Do you? Christ, yeah. really? Oh, yeah, and yeah, full yeah. health. But why? Don't you think it's fun to be alive? Well, he, well, if it is fun to be alive, it's fun to be alive. But sometimes I think living yeah. too long is a curse. Well, I saw a woman just this week who was 98 and she was still running 5Ks. God, is that right? Well, I guess she, she didn't have a, She hadn't had a fall like me. She didn't have a bad ankle. I mean, did you notice if her glutes were firing? <laughs> <laughs> she got a pair of bottom. I think her pelvic floor was like a steel trap. I've got no doubt about that. <laughs> uh, listen, Jackie, thank you so much. Um, it's been really great to speak to you. Thanks for being so candid. It's um, been really nice to speak My to you. My pleasure. It's been lovely. Bye. Bye. Well, next week, would you believe it, the How To Be 60 podcast is a year old. Karen and I have been slugging it out for a whole 12 months and not strangled each other yet. To celebrate, we'll be joined by Strictly Head Judge Shirley Ballas, who hopefully for once will give us a 10. Ten.